Good morning. Um, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are, whenever you are. Uh, welcome to another uh, GoTo Unscripted session with me, Kevin Henney. And today I'm joined with, uh, by uh, Hadi Hariri uh, from JetBrains. So, Hadi, um, please introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about what it is that you do at JetBrains and, you know, kind of things that interest you at the moment. Oh, well, my name is Hadi. I work at JetBrains as uh, on developer advocacy, which is uh, you know, for folks that still don't know, it's um, helping developers uh, um, get a grip on technology and mm -hmm. uh, advocating for our tools, etc. Um, and what interests me at the moment, <laughs> guitars. <laughs> 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 and um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I've, uh, I've, you know, I've been in, I've been around the industry uh, for, uh, I can't even remember. Oh, I've got more gray hair. You know, every, every time I go to the, to the hairdresser, I remember when I, when I first went to the hairdresser and uh, they were cutting my hair, and I'm like, oh, look, there's a gray hair. And now it's like, oh, look, there's a black hair there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've been in the industry for a very, very long time. And I think my latest passion has been seeing how we constantly go around in circles and um, we're just kind of like, entangled ourselves in a web of complexity that we can't seem to get out of. We just keep increasing. Yeah, and I think that it's interesting, you'd, the complexity thing is, I never, I don't think I ever had to talk about complexity until I entered software development. And I mean that in the kind of like, when it comes up in conversations or even stuff I did at university and I didn't do computer science first time around at university but I remember the first job I had after university one of the greatest insights I had from my project manager who was technical is he said oh Kevin actually all of this it's about managing complexity and you know it, it was not quite you know I saw the summit of the mountain and understood but it really yeah. reframed the whole of software development it's just okay that's what we're trying to do is doing that <laughs> and then there's kind of the follow on questions like and how good are we at it it's, it, it seems to be that we are very good at manufacturing or creating oh, yeah, complexity. Oh yeah, we're the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just like, you, you see that simple problem? No, no, that's, uh, that's we can take that. Yeah. We, can, we can take that and make it more complex. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you think about complexity, do you, when, you know, when talking about developers, because I mean, you, as a developer advocate, that means you get in, you, you're in contact with a lot of people and you see a lot of different things. And people are going to ask lots of different questions or come at you with different, a different angle. And I guess there's sometimes there's a hidden agenda that they don't realize. And it's, you know, how, how does this tooling or this language, whatever, solve this? And you kind of scratch a bit further and you think, oh, well, what are they actually asking? Yeah. You, you scratch a little further and they're probably asking something that is to do with a hugely created complexity of theirs. It's like, oh, okay, right. I wouldn't be, I would not want to solve that problem because I wouldn't want to be there. But now you've got it. That's kind of interesting. So, so this idea of, you know, Brooks called it accidental complexity as opposed to the essential complexity. So, do you think that is that's endemic in the industry? Is that is that just part of what we do, or is it part of what who we are? I think it's part of who we are, with help from the industry. <laughs> like I, I, you know, it's it's kind of. I think that, I mean, the majority of us that you know, got into software development. I guess, I mean, I speak for myself, I got into it when I started to realize how much I love automating things. And that was just like, it was like, this is brilliant, you know, like I can automate stuff. And, and then at some point it clicked like, oh look, I can automate stuff and, and, and help people be more efficient. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and on top of that, I'm getting paid for it. So it becomes right. a profession, it becomes yeah. a career. It's brilliant, right? So, but that idea of tackling a problem and trying to find a solution for it, I think that's part of us, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and we all enjoy that. The, the problem is that often we, I think we get lost in forgetting what the problem is and just, you know, trying to play with the, with the solutions that the industry offers us, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, and that's that's an interesting one because that's one of the, one of the observations that I've had. Because occasionally I get asked, you know, what is it that makes a good 
good developer? You know, what is it? You know, if you're going to be a programmer, what is it that you? What are the things? And, you know, there's historically, oh, you know, you need to have good mathematical skills. Mm, not so much, you know. And, and 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 there's all kinds of different things. And you eventually meet so many people. You go like, well, okay, actually, it's not any of the standard things. And but there do seem to be a couple of common threads. And one of them, exactly as you said, is that problem solving. There has to be something within you that probably drives that. And that that that's regardless of any kind of other background you have. But I think one of the other things that makes the perfect storm is that perhaps um, there's also an element of creativity. And you put those two together and yeah. we're able to create some amazing problems that we yeah, solve. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's a perfect storm. <laughs> and then, and, and so therefore we love that kind of tinkering, that possibility of like, the, oh, I wonder what this tool gives me, I wonder what this API is, and what if, and if I do this, and if I have this call back to, and you know, if I, yeah. and, and it's very easy to escalate. And as you say, you know, you forget the original problem. It's that kind of, you know, you get into the flow state, <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> but, but you get swept away by the flow. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Then you know, you know, as the saying goes, you know, you, a, a solution looking for a problem, right? You, yeah. You, I've got this brilliant thing. I don't know what it's solving, but it's brilliant, right? It's fantastic. Yeah. So, so I think it is a combination of both, and I and I don't think it's ill-intentioned. Uh, you know, I don't think any of us go about saying, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm going to come up with the most overly complex architecture I could possibly come up with. I mean, imagine that in any other field. You know, like, a, a, you know. A, Building bridges. Oh well, I'm not just going to build a bridge to cross this pond. So no, I'm going to over-engineer it in case tomorrow yeah. we need something else. And and yet we we do that all the time. I yeah, mean, all the time. I mean, I've been, you know, I've seen the other yesterday. Actually, we were doing a recording um, of my uh, podcast, um, and this this section is brought to you by Talking Kotlin Podcast. So, <laughs> so check it out. Yeah. And uh, you know, we we're talking to uh, the guest that had written a book on uh, design patterns, and. We're talking about how the whole gang of four and how, you know, what is the worst thing that you've encountered over your lifetime in terms of overuse of design patterns. Mm -hmm. And I clearly remember when I was doing consultancy, going to a customer that had actually a code base that had organized their code based on folder names of design patterns, right? I'm not, I'm not kidding you. Okay, I'm going to just roll my jaw straight back up there. That is, I'm not kidding that you. trumps the story I have and on that one. And it's just like, you know, because he, he was, he was, the guest was saying about how, uh, you know, someone had said, oh, I've actually managed to use most of the design patterns in the Gang of Four book. And it reminded me of that time where I had, <laughs> you know, oh. like, you could, you could structure your code based on features, on, on, you know, MVC, whatever. No, this was on design patterns. Like, I have all my decorators here. I have all my strategy patterns here. Yeah. Wow, that's, yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's an interesting one because I think there's, there's um, I think this kind of ties into sometimes the way that we create. We, uh, we mistake one thing for another. So I, I was, um, I, I've been into design patterns for a while. In fact, I remember the time before design patterns. And um, it has always distressed me that people have misunderstood them. And some people treat them as a checklist. Um, you know, they're always a set of principles I need to check off. And it's just like, you do know there are more than 23 design patterns. And actually, the 23 in that book aren't really very contemporary or well aligned. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's a good first step. You know, it's, that book is 30 years old um, as of next year. And it's just like, yeah, d d really impressive, you know. But they did not intend, that was never their goal. And when you understand design patterns, it's like you're supposed to be solving problems. And then people sort of, oh, it's a checklist. And I remember my own, my own kind of horror story, but honestly, having folders organized by design patterns, that, that beats it. Yeah, that was, that was. Yeah, because we actually, we, we talk about that um, in uh, Pattern Oriented Software Architecture, Volume 5, that I wrote with Frank Bushman and Doug Schmidt. We kind of talk about how people misunderstand it. And they start thinking of these things as like checklist items or, oh, they're like components, and therefore you add them to one another. And we actually demonstrate you cannot have exactly the architecture you described. That's actually not possible if you are writing so sensible software. But I remember just one company, and it was like, I, you know, I, I was remember looking at the code, and I just couldn't understand what was going on. And I thought, oh, I've just been in the car for two and a half hours. Maybe I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just staring at the road, and maybe I'm not just, just missing something here. And eventually, and it was a very slow penny. It dropped, and it was in a, it was a notification relationship based on Observer, and it was built up to be something like MVC. And I said, you got the callbacks going the wrong way. And the guy said, oh, oh, right. Oh, okay. And I said, but you told, you know, he said, you know, it's actually fairly clear. You've got to really understand the motivation of this and read through that. He said, 
I'm, I'm a senior developer. I, I don't need to read the words. I just look at the code in the book and that, that and then I kind of, <laughs> and it's just like, well, clearly that's not how this works because it's all a discussion about what you're supposed to be thinking and then here's some code to demonstrate what we're thinking. It's not a copy and paste exercise. Yeah. But that thing, and that, that they eventually, that I remember discovering that that team had actually pretty much, they did a pattern a day. There are about, tw there are 23 design patterns officially in that book. It's about 23 working days in the month. Just yeah. to, you know, it's pretty much, you know, what day is it today? I, you know, what? I think today's Singleton Day. Didn't we have that last Tuesday? Oh, we always say, we always fill the extra days with Singleton. And they've you already know, had to print it out calendar. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I remember mentoring some developers a few months later from this team. And when I kind of hit the section design patterns, everybody went like this. And I thought, what has happened? How has the earth been so poisoned that these people... And then they told me some of the designers. Says, yeah, there's this bit where there should be a flag. So we use the state pattern. Yeah. It's just like, actually, what you want is a flag. It's an if statement. That's it. Sometimes an if statement is just, just an, if, an statement, if statement. You know, yeah, and, exactly. and that, that's just fine. Exactly. And yeah, they, yeah, they had created this amazing thing. I and mean, it was very enterprisey in the worst sense of that word. Yeah. But I mean, but it, you know, I mean, I talk about seeing this in other code bases. I've done it myself, right? I mean, I, when I started out, and, and and not even when I started out for many years, I was over engineering everything. You know, mm -hmm. I was, I was creating these abstractions, and I was creating interfaces that only ever had a single implementation. And and you, you just, you know, I I, I wrote the other day um, on um, this uh, social media. It's called Twitter. Uh, I, I've heard, heard of that. Heard one. of it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I said, you know, we, we build in these flexibilities in clean architectures uh, to try and, uh, you know, use them at some point in the lifespan and end up creating these complex code bases that don't make use of everything that we mm. foresee, right? And, and I look at my own code bases and it was exactly that. I would yeah. like create these monstrous code bases of abstractions and, and flexibility and, you know, throw in a DLL or a jar and it'll instantly recognize it. Like, did I ever use that? No. Yeah. Did I ever need it? No. Yeah, it's, it's the whole what if, and this actually, interestingly enough, goes with the, um, what I mentioned about the creativity. And it, it turns out the more imagination you have, the worse this gets, because you're imagining all the possible futures. Yeah. And so your skill at imagination, there's absolutely nothing wrong with imagination. It's a, an immensely powerful tool. But the danger is we kind of take a speculation and we embed it as a commitment in the code. And yeah. exactly as you've, you can so this is going to be a confessional. I've definitely done that, and I've kind of looked at those things, and sometimes you kind of look at them a few, few years later, and it's always one of those things. It's always good to go back to things that you wrote or uh, uh, you know, uh, worked on in the past and kind of get that kind of sense of like, and how do I feel about that now? And it, it was, we often don't do that, but it can be quite healthy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wasted my life. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, at that point, you know, maybe I should have just sold ice creams and made more people happy. You know, you, you know, who doesn't like an ice cream vendor? Um, <laughs> but but there's, there's a humility that comes with that, and you know. But sometimes there is this kind of like. Sometimes you kind of get the that sense of like, yeah, yeah, I was wrong about that. But perhaps the thing about you, you talk about helping other people. And sometimes the thing is maybe we can't save ourselves; we can save somebody else. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and and I had this opportunity with a team uh, a number of years ago, uh, visited them um, over a number of years. And one of the most interesting things is we got to the end of the you know sunset uh, uh, period of that. You know, it'd been over a decade. And and yeah, so, so how did that go? It wasn't a formal retrospective, you know. And one of the guys said, you know all those times you said we were over-engineering and that, you know, yeah, you were right. Because we also said, uh, did any of those decisions, uh, any, did any of the shortcuts taken for deadlines and any of the over-engineer or the extensions and generalizations that you put in that we, we discussed and debated, did any of those work out? And it's just like, oh. And it turns out that the, the greatest value that they had had was in separating stuff and keeping it simple. Yeah. And just, it really was, you know, and, and that was a hugely hard, but they, were, they became one of the best teams I've ever worked with. But they, they found that actually just keeping things kind of small and simple and comprehensible and tested and uh, all of this kind of stuff was actually, I mean, it took an immense amount of discipline. It turns out it's harder to do that than it is to create complexity. But that was the thing that actually, they said that was the biggest game, game yeah. changer in the long term. Yeah. And we have this at so many levels. I mean, you know, now, uh, you know, before I was listening to some of the interviews and I mean, every time you talk about software now, you hear Kubernetes, you hear Docker, you hear 
microservices, you hear nano services, Pico services, you hear whatever services you want, right? And it it just sometimes makes me wonder why. Like, yeah. Why are we why are we doing all of these things? Yeah. Right? And like it's and why are we know, doing this to ourselves? Why why are we doing this? <laughs> you know, it's uh so I uh, it's it's like Back in my day, you know, back in the old <laughs> days, I mean, even the, the web development stuff, right? It, we used to do this thing called, there was, a, there, was a, there was an application that was a CGI or an ISAPI, and it used to sp spit out some HTML combined with data, and it used to render a web page, right? And it used to work. And then someone said, no, users need uh, instance, instant updates. So we're going to do invent this whole thing called single page application, right? Twenty years later, you're coming back to articles that are saying, "Oh, to get better usability and performance, we're going to do this thing called server side rendering." It's like, right? That's what we used to do. It's a cycle. Yeah. Twenty five years ago, it was called you know CGI. Or, yeah. Well, CGI is serverless now, right? <laughs> yeah. Do you remember CGI? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like you used to call an executable. Right now, you call a function, and they call it serverless. Yeah, and and now we've now we're driven to this whole cloud native, right? Which which for me is fascinating because, I mean, if you take a look at any of the cloud providers, uh, I'm, I'm you know I'm not single pointing out anyone, but you, you take a look at Google cloud providers, you take a look at Azure, you take a look mm -hmm. at AWS. AWS. The other day, I was scrolling through the services they provide. It's like twenty pages of services that they provide that you don't even know. Like you have to take a course to figure out what it is that you need to learn to then take a course on that, to then figure out what you need to do. And then by the time you finish all of that, it's already obsolete or legacy mm -hmm. and they've come out with a new service. And you know, take that, well, because when I was saying to you that the industry kind of helps motivate us to do yeah. this, Right, take that, combine it with our eagerness to solve problems and to automate stuff, and you're like, oh, look, shiny little toys. Oh, I can play with all of this and put yeah. all this together and create this massively over-complex, scalable architecture that no one's ever going to use. Yeah. For what? Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's, that, that, that kind of idea of trying to understand there's a feedback loop that, that we're sometimes missing. And it's just like, so exactly you said, the scalable thing I think is absolutely fascinating um, because many people say, oh, well, we do this to be more scalable. Well, what is it that you're doing? You know, do you have a scalability problem? No. And it turns out that they are borrowing, you know, the, the standard thing, go to a conference, you see the big names, yeah. they make their recommendations or talk about their, their, their architecture. And they, these people are, you know, the, the Googles and so on, they are doing planet-wide engineering at this level. Yeah. And the point is that what is it that you're doing? Um, uh, uh, you know, I know somebody who wrote software um, uh, for a, a, a funeral company. And, you know, although, you know. How scalable is that going to be? You know, <laughs> how scalable do you expect that to be? By the time, the, by the time you start hitting that kind of curve, That's you have, your problem. trust me, software is the least of your worries. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, and, and that was the whole thing. And he, he, he were there and he, he, he's, he, he did one generation of the product. Now, some, now a larger team, two people generate the first, uh, developed the first generation. Now a larger team was in and they were rewriting and it was all microservices this, microservices there. And he said, well, they spent an awful lot longer apparently doing a lot less, but there appears to be way a lot of code. Most of the code is, is as it were, feeding the, the frameworks. You know, the framework says, I want to do it. The framework that was supposed to make things easy, you're now bowing before, oh, you want this, you want this, yeah. I need to feed you that, I need, yeah. to, I need to respond to this. And suddenly, it's not that there is no case where these are, may, may um, be reasonable, but the result for the developers is that they are constantly feeding this, and somewhere in the heart of that is the idea of the business and the user. It's sort of lost in there, and there's all of this stuff. And, and that's a really common experience. And I, I see it in the blog space as well. Where there's, I, I see lots of practices that are being recommended as good that are reversals of the simplifications that we've been encouraging people for a long time. Yeah. And it's kind of like, what drives this? And it's again that idea that sometimes, you know, you say the industry, but also 
Sometimes when I make something look intricate, it makes it look like it's a solution. And again, going back to, as you said, it's a solution in search for a problem. And I've seen so many recommendations there. And you say, oh, why don't you just create an object here? Oh, but you might want to change this and that. So we're going to parameterize it and do this. And before you know it, you know, you're shooting up and injecting everything. And it's just like, but you could just create an object just right there, right, right there in that line of code. And that would be it. And that, you know, yeah. I know, <laughs> and yeah, yeah and, and so and it's, it's addictive. Yeah, <laughs> it is, and it's conferences block. I mean, I, I, I remember clearly. I, I remember when this happened. Uh, it was kind of like the first time I had heard of Uber, right? Because I mean, I lived in Spain. What well, I still do, you know. Uber only came to Spain a couple of months ago. Uh, so. <laughs> uh, we got strong union taxis, <laughs> taxi unions, and uh, and there was this blog post of uh, you know how Uber went from Postgres to MySQL for mm. performance. It was back in 2013. And, and I just saw a whole bunch of folks saying, oh yeah, I have this problem. No, you don't, no, I do. I, I, I got to move to MySQL as well. Yeah, and then another one's like, so why are you using MySQL? Well, because Postgres is crap, why? Well, look at this blog post. Right, okay, 2016, Uber comes out with another blog post, moving from MySQL to Postgres, right? Now, it could have been the other way around or whatever, but in the interval of three years, I'm like, you could have just not read that blog post and save yourself a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's like, we just copy everyone, right? Yeah. Because it looks cool, it looks interesting. We're gonna do, we're gonna do chaos monkey engineering. Do you ever need that for your funeral home? No, but it's bloody yeah. brilliant, yeah. isn't it? I think that's, and I think that's the interesting thing. And it goes back to the kind of like the the not getting the point of design patterns type thing. Um, it, it's another one of these uh, kind of ideas of not understanding the full idea. Is that a lot of these people, you know, the Ubers, they are dealing with particular scales. A lot of these people are solving problems that they have, but it doesn't mean it's your problem. Exactly. And that's the idea. It's like, we should take these as data points in a large landscape of like, that person in this situation had this particular problem. They identified it this way. This is the pain it caused them. This is where they started. This is where they ended up. And their journey continues. And they may do an about turn, which is exactly what you described. But that's the point. Now, the question is, do you have that problem? Or are you just looking at the surface waves, the surface ripples? the easy thing which is they made this migration we must make that migration yep. and it's like you know as you said we, we like to copy things and that is one of humanity's greatest skills and failures you know yeah, copying it's one of the things we're really good at you know it, it gives us stuff like civilization uh, written language all of this kind of yeah. stuff it's just like yeah copying absolutely amazing but it also gives us fashion and overuse of microservices um, and, and stuff like that you yeah. know yes. and we have the same with microservices you see now articles about uh, going back from microservices to monoliths right I mean you know Simon you know Simon yeah, I know Brown, Simon, right? Yeah. And he said it clearly it's like if you don't know how to write a proper monolith microservice aren't going to help yeah. you. You're just going to end up with a lot of little really badly bad monoliths. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's where we are. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a really interesting observation because again, it goes back to the most one of the most important things for me that I learned um, originally in uh, trying to learn about patterns, not just this gang of four stuff, but actually going back and trying to understand. Is that for me the the, the, the greatest insight I had was trying to understand. Oh, this is about context. What you're trying to do is say, I've got this problem in this context. I don't just yeah. have this problem. I have this problem in this context. Yes. And if that context changes, then the nature of my problem changes. If my context is different to your context, and that context can be as anything as detailed as a programming language. You know, I'm in a particular programming language. I am following these practices. So if I'm in a... Um, uh, if I'm in a, a programming language where I have to manage the memory myself, there are going to be a set of problems that I have, and there are also probably a set of practices that I could follow that keep me on the straight and narrow. But I can't simply transplant that to a managed language and say, oh, look, I'm using the same techniques, because it's just like, well, no, you have some memory problems, but they're different, and the tools available to you are also different. In other words, you yeah. are not in the same context. Yeah. And this is the idea we like to have the one rule, you know, oh, one rule, and now we're gonna solve it that way. Yeah. And, and we've ended up with exactly this. So sometimes people are moving to microservices for uh, the right reasons, but whenever anybody says we're moving to microservices because we've made a mess of engineering something that's a monolith, it's just like, and what makes you think that you're going to not make a mess of this? If you're moving to microservices for, you know, the elasticity, the flexibility, um, and you know, uh, and all the other kind of performance characteristics that hits the mark, 
Microservices will always make a piece of code more complex, or they will make the architecture more complex. But there's this, the, the equivalent, put it all in one place. But then if you're doing it for reasons of structuring, maybe you get lucky. Maybe you do end up with a better architecture. But the chances are you're going to end up with the same problems because it's probably developed by the same people. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Why are we going to think? It's, it's like it was our code all along. You yeah, know? yeah. It, was, it well, wasn't the platform. It wasn't the architecture. It wasn't any the database. It was our code. That we was have the met the enemy, and here's us. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's the interesting thing that many people are not confronting this. And I think you know, and that is that's one of the, you know, it's one of the lessons of history. Um, uh, given that we both have grey hair, um, <laughs> one of the lessons of history is watching it being repeated. Um, and there is that observation, you know, there are a couple of observations, the classic one being, you know, if you, if you, um, uh, uh, those who do not understand history are, are doomed to repeat it. But there's the counterpoint to that, which is those who do understand history are doomed to watch it being repeated. Yeah, um, yes. And, you know, we can't always extract all of the right lessons, but there is this thing, and you kind of threw in the Pico services, nano services thing earlier. I thought that was an interesting one. Well, I mean, you see it. I mean, you're like, sometimes when, when the whole uh, microservices came out, you just, there were, there were times that you, you had to facepalm when you would hear conversations of like, Hmm, how many classes const, you know, constitute a microservice? And, and how many lines of code? Is a, is, a, is a class with a single method a microservice or is it a, a nano service? Like why? Why are we having these types of conversations? You know, why? You know? And then on top of this, I mean, you talk about patterns and we talk about architectural patterns and you talk about microservices. And then when you, like CQS, right? Command and query separate. Yeah. Uh, many years ago, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with uh, CQRS that yes. came about, right? Uh, which, if you uh, if you were around back then, which you were, we were. Yep. If you would actually uh, Google CQRS, Google would respond, "Did you mean cars?" <laughs> like it used to say, "Did you mean cars?" There's actually a blog po the blog which is CQRS dot. A block, a block spot or something like that, and the tagline is, did you mean cars? Because Google didn't know what CQRS was, right? And so Greg Young, who was yeah. talking about CQRS, was also doing event sourcing. Yeah. And then people thought that, well, if I'm doing CQRS, I have to do event sourcing. And they started to like add this complexity of event sourcing to situations and contexts that didn't apply. Mm. And it's just like, no, we got to do CQRS with event sourcing. And it's not, well, it's not working out well, oh, because you're lacking domain-driven design. Now you got to throw in the domain-driven design. Now you're going to get all of that. And we keep seeing like how we keep adding these levels of complexity to things instead of just thinking about, hey, you know what CQRS is? It's just about having your read separates from your rights. Yeah. You know, it's about not needing the ORM at times, right? Yeah. And we do the same with microservices. Oh, you're using microservices. Yes, then you need to use, uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes. Why? Well, because you can't just, you know, deploy a container. Why? Well, because you need Kubernetes for scale. Okay, but I don't have scale. Doesn't matter. Just in case you need it. And then you need all of these monitoring services. And then you need to... Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, and it, it, it does become, and exactly as you say, there's this kind of, you go to pick one off the shelf, but then a bunch of other uh, stuff uh, comes yeah. with it. Have you thought about this, sir? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, madam, how about one of these like, and one of those? You go into a car like, showroom, you know, it's like, oh, well, now that you're getting a car, you might as well get this yeah, up yeah. <laughs> You kind of walk in, you're really simple, you know, I'm, I'm after a motorbike, and you walk out with just like <laughs> yeah, yeah, a camper van, and it's just like, and that's the point, is every single one of the ideas that we're talking about is individually useful, it has an appropriate place, an appropriate time and place, and there's no criticism of these things at that level. But then, it's just the, you know, it's that, it's that kind of like shiny hammer syndrome and you eventually end up asking the question like you know is this the right hammer for this screw <laughs> it's just like it's a complete mismatch but more importantly you just then start dragging all these other things by association oh if you're doing this you need this yeah you know. i mean it's worth considering them but you don't necessarily need it and that's that's where i think you know going back to the the heart of this the complexity where does it come from is it is this aggregate kind of quality it's like it's got this gravitational field that pulls in all these other things. And as you say, CQRS, in principle, is a profoundly simple idea that can benefit a whole load of architectures. Hey, you can have a different read stream from a write stream. You can optimize them and have different technologies. As long as you're happy with the data quality differences, if you have that kind of, this is brilliant, absolutely fantastic. And suddenly, you've got something else there, which 
you know, the big break there is breaking from you know, kind of acid transactional tyranny, let's call it, yeah. um, where we have to lock everything and, and lose all kinds of scalability. And this is great for a large class of things. That's fantastic. But then, as you say, what's throwing the event sourcing? Let's throw this, this, this. And suddenly it's just like, and are we doing this with microservices? Because that sounds like microservices. And then you draw in that <laughs> domain as well. But I think that, that, that the funny thing that for me with the microservices stuff is watching, again, that historical aspect being repeated because when people coined that term, around it, the first time I saw anybody talking about microservices was with Fred George, and that was about 10 years ago. And, and he had a really clear idea. He was, he was very clear about how he was doing it and what he was doing. And it was genuinely to do with, like, we want small pieces. We want yeah. something that you can actually, an individual developer can write easily and will be quite happy to pretty much throw away and write again. And these days, these might, you know, and he had a very clear, the word micro was justified in what he was advocating. And, and these days, when people talk microservices, you kind of look at it and go like, I remember the whole kind of services the first time around. And you've now created stuff that's now bigger than what everybody was accusing. That, you know, and so now we need to scale down. The, the, we're, we're at Pico and it goes down to you. Yeah. yeah it's just, and it's it, so tightly coupled that if one service goes down, the whole yeah. system goes down. Yeah. But that defeated the purpose of the thing. No. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because there are a couple of phrases uh, um, and I, I, I know that um, Frank Bushman and I did a talk where we actually took an excerpt from um, Clement Sapersky's um, book on component software in the late 90s. A really important book, um, really talking about you know the thinking and so on and the rationale behind it. And a lot of that stuff also seemed like almost old because he was very good at giving a historical context and a narrative there. And it's funny, we took a paragraph out of it and uh, just what is a component, and it was identical to what is a service just a few years later, the, the SOA style service, and is identical to what we would now call microservices. It was so funny, it was just this particular paragraph, and you know, you either had to change no words or one or two words, and it was just like, hmm, we've been here before, and it's not that, n not that none of these are any, they all make progress in some way, and they're all helpful to a large class of systems, but when people come up and say, this is gonna help us, in what way? We're not sure. Because other people are doing it, it will give it, you know, we have faith, you know, you know it's, uh, and we yeah. will be blessed by the right outcomes. Yeah. And it, it reminds me of the, when you said the, the definition of a service, I remember back in the WCF days, remember WCF? And uh, so they had come up with uh, the four tenants of services by Microsoft, uh, and there was four, right? And uh, it was, uh, you know the, the the four WCF complied with the four uh, tenants of of services, but of course Thomas Earl had eleven, right? But you didn't need yeah. the eleven; the four was enough, right? <laughs> you know. yeah. I'd forgotten that distinction. Yes. Yeah. So there's an interesting kind of cycle there, um, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of it's almost like there's a merry-go-round, and we, what we want to do is each time round, we want to be aware that we're going round. And just like, you know, it's just like, hey, this time around we're doing it like this, and we've called it this, and we're totally aware of that, and let's not fall into the same traps regarding silver bullets and, you know, hey, guess what, you know, this is the silver bullet that will do this. Haven't we fired off a bunch of silver bullets before? I'm pretty sure we have. You know, I've got, I've got kind of the, the, the wounds to show it. Haven't we found, you know, let's just understand the thing that this does give us, and then there's all these other things, and be really clear in our minds that these are not necessarily going to happen by magic. This is why we want this technology, because this is the difference it makes to us, yeah. you know, as opposed to all of these other things, which genuinely get a bit cargo culty. Yeah. You know? And I mean, you know, there's, there's many people that argue unfairly uh, that we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, coming up with new solutions, we're trying to find new ways to solve the same problems and, and so on and so forth. But one of the things that I've found a lot, again, with us is that, you know, let's say that I have a framework, mm. okay? And that framework works for 80% of the cases. And now I need a special case that doesn't cover it. So I won't you know, make a special case, I will create a new framework that um, covers my cases and a little bit more. Mm. And I do that at the expense of complexity. Mm. I do that at the expense of, I'm not taking something that we know, building on it 
and abstracting the complexity away, mm. I'm making the developer have to deal with that complexity. I'm yeah. making them have to deal with the complexity of learning the framework, learning everything underneath it. And I don't understand that part, you know? It's, it feels like we are trying to, every time we talk about applications and user experiences, we always try and say, let's make the experience more pleasant for the user. Let's not make the user have to understand the application in, in you know, know that they've got to go to three menu items to accomplish what they want to do. And yet we don't seem to apply that to ourselves. Yeah. Like as developers, we don't say, let's try and abstract away things to the point that it makes it simpler for people to use yeah. as opposed to, no, you know, I mean, if you take a look at any of the frameworks, like I remember, you know, we were just joking earlier about, yeah, I gave a talk on AngularJS. Yes, it was a horrendous mistake I made, right? And then React.js came about, and then there was this flux architecture of React.js, which is this massive diagram of all of these parts, and you're like, why? Like, what, why do I need to understand all of this, right? Yeah. Why? I mean, it, it was easier to understand machine code. Seriously, the, the 68,000 Motorola assembly was easier than, than, than programming with React.js. And I don't get it. I, I really don't. I, I think we just, like, we enjoy complexity. Yeah. I think, well, I think it, it becomes its own reward. It's like, it's, it's, like, it's, it's like a puzzle. You know, again, that's the other aspect. It's like these, these aspects, creativity, problem solving, and, 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 and they're in that we find puzzle solving. And they're... And complexity has its own reward, its own intricacy, and they, they can be a lot of fun when you created something like that. I mean, I think, in that sense, software development is one of the most creative professions that we have. You literally can create something from nothing. You can summon things from the universe. You know, in in, in times past, you know, developers would have been, you know, <laughs> burnt at the burnt stake. At the stake. But, yeah. you know, you're casting magic. <laughs> and although some people may have the opinion that that should be the continue to be the case, <laughs> I'm definitely not going to advocate that. Um, but we do have this invitation to complexity. Um, because there's so much to know. I mean, that's the thing, is that there's so much to possibly know, but perhaps sometimes we don't make it easier. Although, I, I, you know, going back to your point, no, earlier on, nobody ever sets out to over-engineer things. Nobody has the meeting and said, so uh, we're going to develop this. And so, uh, any suggestions for how we should do it? I think we should over-engineer it beyond comprehension, but we should do it under the veil and mandate of simplicity. No, <laughs> nobody's going to say that. And if exactly. somebody does say that and you're in that meeting, you know what to do. You, you stop and actually if it's a Zoom meeting and you happen to be the host, you can just kind of just oh, yeah. Yeah, yes. accidentally yeah. kick them out. Yeah. You know, oops, your connection was dropped. You know, the, the point there is, but that, <laughs> that opportunity doesn't happen. That's not how it happens. It happens over time. And, and people go in with such good intentions. Every single framework is, is always an attempt to simplify. But then things start leaking out, leaky abstraction. And you sort of end up having to say, I now need to know the universe in order to use this. Yeah. There is a common cycle yeah. there, and then uh, even like with uh, with uh, presentation patterns and like you know we talk about MVC, simple concept. Okay, MVC. Now I'm doing a desktop application MVP. Okay, now M MVP doesn't quite work. I'm going to do MVVM. Okay, what's MVVM? Well, there's this long blog post of 17 pages that tells you the the subtle differences between MVP and MVP MVVM. And then you know six months later, now MVVM is sucks. I'm going to do MVI. And it's just, and when you look at it, it's basically the same thing. Just yeah. someone decided to call it differently. You know? Yes, I, I must confess that that's been my. Uh, the funny thing is that a lot of it is like, wait a minute, isn't that just a variation of that? Should we not acknowledge that? But in other cases, there's a lot of you know, um, there's a lot of MVC stuff you look at and go, well, having been familiar with the original MVC, it's just like, yeah, it's not quite what we had in mind, but you know, it, it, it's, there's, there's calling different things the same name and then there's calling things by different names that are actually essentially variations of the same idea. Yeah. It seems we have, you know, naming is one of the hardest problems we know. Yep. Um, but there is that idea and, it, and we, you know, we like to explore the space. As you say, we're all trying to solve different things, but it's a sense of like we are repeating some of the same mistakes rather than finding new mistakes to make. Yes. I mean, that, I mean that, you know, that's for me, a problem. That, that's a problem. You know, that's the thing we should be doing is there's a lot of innovation to be had, but we spend a lot of time, it's necessary, I think it's necessary, we, we always repeat certain mistakes and certainly and as an individual in the profession, you have to go through certain mistakes that you're going to make. Nobody can think for you, nobody can understand your code. You, know, you have to go through that. So, but it does seem collectively we are capable of making some of the same mistakes. It's kind of like, should we mark that one as done so we can make new and exciting 
exciting mistakes yes. that actually push us into different spaces yeah. rather than hovering in the same same areas. Yeah. And then when you you know uh, you're you've been in in, in in the industry as long as we have, and you start saying, "Oh, but that we kind of," and you're like, "Oh, shut up, you you know, old man screaming at the cloud or whatever." <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm not really. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I actually did have that one experience. I thought, uh, you know, when somebody showed me something and said, oh, are you doing that? That's asynchronous. Okay. Have you had this problem? Yeah, you know, Rather than saying, oh, yeah, we did this back in the day, shout at, cl shout at cloud. You know, it's just like, if you had this, yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's, you've, like, it's like you've seen our code. Yeah, it is. It, yeah, <laughs> I did. <guess. laughs> you know, Forty years ago. Yeah, yeah, and so there is an element yeah. there. Yeah, we, it, there's a. It, it's it's interesting because we're a knowledge-based profession, and yet surprisingly, and we are very good at individually learning certain things. It's just like developers are always tracking moving targets, so their skill at learning is great. But there's the kind of the bigger learning that we're not necessarily so good at uh, collectively, and it, there, there seems to be a kind of like a, a kind of a paradox there almost. Yeah. That, you know. So you mentioned something earlier on. We were talking about you know, building web services um, and, and, uh, and talking about microservices, but really all of this kind of like stuff of like, I want to put something out there so that other things can communicate with it. You've been working on something recently that is uh, you know, in, in, that, in that kind of space. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm on the um, per, uh, KTOR uh, project, which is uh, an open source framework that we've developed at JetBrains uh, for Sorry, creating microservices. <laughs> uh, it's it's for creating connected service, uh, connected systems. So essentially, it's like a, it's a multi-platform because it's written in Kotlin. Yeah. Um, so it's multi-platform, uh, meaning that you can actually like now build uh, with the 2.0 release that we just released. You can build uh, servers mm. using Kotlin native, which yeah. means no JVM, nothing. Yeah. Just targeting, you know, binary. Like in the old days, you know, yeah. like the compilers and linkers and get your EXEs. Uh, and then it's got a client which is also multi platform, so you can use it on iOS and mobile and all of these different yeah. things. Yeah. You see that you see because I, I had a look I had a quick look at that and, and I, I thought, oh this is quite interesting because it seems that it, curiously enough the thought went through my head. It's 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 it's, it's it, kind of validated by what you just said. I thought, it's reclaiming some lost territory here because actually it does look, I mean, I, I can't, you know, <laughs> you know, if somebody wants to look at this interview in five years' time, go, yeah, he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> that, that turned out to be terrible, you know. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do a, we'll yeah. a review. But just at the level, but a couple of things there. One was the, the Kotlin native aspect. And I thought, actually, interesting thing in terms of uh, uh, Kotlin does seem to have stuck to its, you know, it's now just over 10 years old. Um, and it, it seems to have stuck fairly closely to its original vision of basically, yeah, we want to program something like Java, but there's a lot of extra noise um, in that. And there are so many things that we do that are common that should be brief. You know, those things which are, are common should be shorter type thing. Whereas yeah. uh, uh, justifiably Java gets that as a criticism that even doing the most trivial thing, it's not that it's not possible, it's just that You've, you've got to spend a lot of time doing it. And if you're getting paid by the line of code, this is a, this is a magnificent yeah, solution. Ah, absolutely, yeah, you know, absolutely. ignore every recommendation we make um, uh, in this talk. But, but there is that idea of actually it seems to have stuck fairly close to that mission statement yeah. and seems to have optimized in that space. It, and it goes back to that idea of the developer user experience. Uh, you know, the developers are users, what's their experience like? So Colin seems to kind of fit comfortably in that space, but then also giving you that, so actually solving the portability problem and so, you know, there is a return to native because you know people are interested in that. But actually, we also need to run things on VMs and so on. And it seems to sort of say, yeah, this is kind of a solved problem. We can take care of that. This is something we can take care yeah. of. So I was quite impressed by just looking, just sifting through some of the examples on KTOR, going like, actually, these are these are fairly simple. And as a non Kotlin programmer uh, and who's not in this space uh, either, I'm looking through this like going, this makes sense. And I'm I'm coming at it as um, not shaking my fist at the cloud, 
but as I say, you know, I'm, I'm, this is all un- subject to change. In five years' time, it could turn into a monster. <laughs> who, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> so actually one of we'll, our goals. We'll put that I mean, disclaimer out there. And I, uh, yeah, but at the moment, what I was what I was seeing is just like, oh, actually, this does look fairly sane. But maybe I'm getting lured in by the examples. But uh, no, we, that's actually. I mean, uh, to give you some background around Kator, what happened is that I used to work. Uh, you know, I've I've gone through many platforms, right? And I, I used to do a lot of .NET. And at the time, I was doing ASP.NET, NBC, and then um, I got kind of interested in, in Node.js, mm. and I started to do a bunch of JavaScript, and then I got hooked onto Express.js. And I really, really liked Express.js because it was so, it was like back to my, uh, you know, roots of ISAPI DLLs where you just basically had an entry point and you would just execute something, and, and I loved it. And uh, so when I started to play with Kotlin, there wasn't anything like that, mm. right? Um, there was the Spring framework, and there was the Spring and Spring. And so I created this framework called Wasabi, uh, which was basically trying to port ExpressJS over to uh, Kotlin. And then one of my colleagues that was working on the Kotlin team uh, started to experiment as well with Kotlin as a DSL mm. and started to create this other thing called Ktor. And then, you know, at some point, we coroutines came out, and of mm-hmm. course, it made sense to to move uh, to to asynchronous. And he had already kind of like started building it on the asynchronous model. Wasabi wasn't, and I'm like, you know, why are we doing two things, right? Yeah. So I said, you know, like I'm going to drop Wasabi, and I'll help you with Ktor. Um, and then eventually, he stepped aside, and then I took over the team. Um, but we like our essence is to try and keep it really, really. Uh, simple, hmm. not and and it's funny because you know folks come come to us and they're like, oh you know if I use Spring or if I use X or if I use Y, uh, I could just like take a class and add an annotation to it and boof I've got it all done. I'm like yeah, you do, but that annotation you pile up seven other annotations and then you don't know what that little line yeah. you know the class definition is doing, and it starts to become. And we want to be more like explicit. We want you to exactly know what is happening, but at the same time not be overly verbose. So that's kind of like the balance that we're trying to keep with Ktor. I kind of like I kind of like the way you've expressed that. And actually, let's let we can step back from Ktor and actually kind of look at that as a sort of general principle and a general approach. Um, the idea of um, the idea of you should know what is going on or and being done on your behalf. You know, you should know what's going on. You know, the, the fact that something's being done on your behalf should not be a matter of magic and yeah. mystery. Um, you know, the annotation stacking, uh, and in fact, there was an interesting one with a, a dependency injection framework a few years back where, uh, you know, members of a team, a couple of members had kind of led the charge and had ended up with so many subtle edge cases and complexity that... Uh, there were very subtle uses and dependencies on subtleties in this thing. And it was interesting because they were kind of like, obviously, this is ov- often the case when people lead an architectural effort. Um, you've always got somebody who, kn- who does know it, everything because they, they were present at all of the key design decisions. They have a deep history there. And then you've got all the newer developers. And it was really interesting that one of the developers said, yeah, I, I don't really know what's going on. When I, when, I, when I have to add in and I extend the code, I'd basically copy and paste something that's already working yeah, exactly. and do that. Because it's just like, well, that's working, and I want something similar and a so variation. Just, Remember, and <laughs> copying is one of the most successful human traits. So that's what they do. They do that as a per, you know, that, that's not, the, they're not being, we need to get away, I think, from the moral judgment somebody who duplicates code is, is bad. No, they're actually doing what is human and safe. It's like, I genuinely don't understand that. It's complexity. The way I can manage that complexity is by copying, is by copying it. it. Yes. And I've taken a thing that already works and now I'm going to adapt it, but I'm going to be really cautious so I don't break it. But I don't genuinely understand how it works, so that's why I'm being cautious. But I am taking a thing that works and that is of value to me. They're being incredibly human and they've, they've, they've done the right thing in that sense. Yeah. The, 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 the thing that is not right is, is perhaps the origin story of this. And the, there we've got, there's a little bit of balance. So we want things to be, we want things to do things on our behalf because we don't actually want to have to write the whole stack. You know, uh, although there are a couple of developers out there, oh yeah, I'm going to do this. this true craft, I'm going to craft all the bits all the way down to the 68,000 level. You know, um, and I, I'm going to build the emulator for that. Yeah, so, you know. <laughs> so, you know. In JavaScript. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, 
you know, you've got that, but the point is you want things done on your behalf. You want that abstraction. You want that benefit. But at the same time, it shouldn't leave you with a sense of mystery of, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, because that is effectively what we end up doing. So there's that balance of like, I've got enough control and I've got enough comprehension. I know what I'm, I can see, I can see what I'm doing. Doesn't mean I'm going to do it perfectly, but then somebody else can see what I'm doing, but we still get the benefits of not having to do it all ourselves. And it's a very careful, and I think there's, there's a careful balance there. Yeah. You, you use the word balance very specifically, and I think a lot of design is that. It's just like, you know, there's something that pulls you this way, but there's also something that pulls you this way. We want things done for us, but at the same time, we want to know what it is that we are creating and have that kind of control. Otherwise, it's not our code. We're, we are merely observers who poke it. Um, we want to, we want to, that it should be our code collectively. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the balance is the hardest thing. And I, and I, and I feel like even myself and, and many, I guess, that it's, it's so much easier to, instead of trying to keep that balance, fall into the trap of complexity and say, look, it's just, it's hard to understand. So you need to, you need to be a, you know, understand all of this so it's 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 hard to keep simple yeah right we don't i think that sometimes we don't put enough effort mm. into that balance yeah right which i think is the is where we are now kind of yeah, yeah. i think it's, it's that idea of like yeah this stuff is hard we acknowledge that it's hard but if we put, uh, but that doesn't mean, but it shouldn't be at the situation of like, well, it was hard to build, so it should be hard to understand. And exactly, <laughs> you know? exactly. Um, and it shouldn't be, you know, the idea is like, yeah, it is hard. We're not gonna say that it's simple, but we will try and simplify it. But to simplify takes enormous effort. It takes a discipline, doesn't it? Exactly. You've got to kind of really focus on that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Right, well, in that case, thank you very much, Hadi. Thank you. And um, good day and good night. I hope this has been useful to you and that you'll join us for more at another point five years' time.